<laughs> All right. So, um, the, so I guess the first part of this talk, we're going to spend a little while talking about um, sort of curvature and places where you see particularly negative curvature. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about this from the point of view of sewing. So um, my background is applied math, but I grew up um, with a mom who's um, sort of a seamstress and knitter and fiber artist, so I knew how to sew a dress well before I learned, knew how to solve an algebraic equation. So um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about uh, curvature from the point of view of clothing. So everyone here, I'm glad to say, is wearing clothes. So I'd like everyone to take a minute and think about the clothes you're, going, you're wearing um, and think about the pattern pieces that make them up. So you might think that, so this is a, a man's <laughs> dress shirt, so I see a, a lot of men wearing button-down shirts and even some women wearing button-down shirts. So think about particularly a button-down shirt. So you might think, oh, well, this is kind of simple. I just take two pieces of cloth, you know, cut them in half, they're identical, sew them together, and that's a shirt. I'll maybe cut it in the, down the center, add some buttons, and I'm done. But it turns out that this is the actual pattern for a man's dress shirt. So there are something like uh, 37 different pieces of fabric, and if you count the seams that go into it, there are in the, the 50s or 60s different seams that are needed to make a man's dress shirt. And you'll also notice that uh, virtually none of these pieces are rectilinear. Not even the pieces that make up the cuffs and the collar that you might think are rectilinear. But um, all of the pieces here tend to have bits of, of curves. And those are important because fabric is flat and humans, no matter how skinny you are, have curves. So the idea is that you want to take a flat piece of fabric and figure out a way using cuts and seams to wrap it around uh, a, a curved body. So seamstresses, um, dress designers, couturiers usually use um, two separate ideas to, to incorporate curvature in their clothing. So the first one is called a dart. So a dart is a way of locally removing a bit of, an er a bit of area. So what you do is you take a flat piece of fabric and you cut out um, a little V-shaped seam and sew it together. So, so this is, uh, so you've taken out a little wedge of area and you sew it up and you basically make a comb. So this is used at places like busts and places that you want to have positive curvature. But if you want to have negative curvature, one thing you can do is you can take that little wedge that you cut out and sew it into another part. So these are called godets. So this is used uh, frequently in places like the hem of a tulip skirt or around um, waists, things like that. So we can do this a little bit more um, mathematically. So I found some fabric that had a uh, really nice uh, six fold symmetry to it. And um, what I did is I cut out a piece that is one sixth of, of the fabric. Um, and then, so from here, uh, I can sew it up. And you'll see that at the center now, instead of having a center of six fold rotational symmetry that I started with, I now have a center of five fold rotational symmetry. And the shape now forms something that is um, a cone. Uh, so I can also now that I cut out a piece, I can now insert that same piece into um, another equivalent piece of fabric. So when I do that, I end up with a seven-fold rotational center here. Um, and now my fabric buckles out of the plane, but it doesn't buckle in the way to make the cone. It buckles um, in a way that would make a saddle. So, or in this case, it's sort of a bit of wavy, wrinkly fabric. So there's sort of wrinkles up and down along here around the circumference. So this is um, a piece called the 567 dress, and it's in the show out front. You may have uh, seen it already, uh, or you'll be able to check it out later. So this is a piece um, made by uh, my friend Andrea Shuey, who is a clothing designer, costume designer, and uh, Robin Sollinger, who is a, a professor of theoretical physics. Um, and the idea here is that uh, they took regular uh, pentagons, hexagons, and heptagons, and sewed them together into the bodice of a dress that is um, 
making use of this idea of adding, uh, taking away angle or adding excess angle to create uh, a fitted uh, uh, a fitted bust. Um, so this is a beautiful couturier wedding dress, um, and this is some human intestines. Mm -hmm. So would you be surprised if I told you that these actually have more in common than meets the eye? So it turns out that the mechanism that um, is used to make this, uh, the, this, the start of this wedding dress is exactly the same reason that the human small intestines ruffle. So what's going on here? So when you're developing, when you're sort of uh, a few cells in, a, in an embryo, the first thing that happens is this process called gastrulation, which is what forms the what's going to become your gut tube. Um, so this is one of the main symmetry breaking that is necessary for life to exist. Um, so what happens is after after that's gone on for a little while, you also develop the neural tube, so the place that is going to form your spine and starts getting. Um, precursor to nerve cells that, that uh, run from your brain down, down the axis of your back. Um, and there's a membrane that connects this, um, uh, the gut tube to your neural tube. And um, as you develop the gut tissue itself, this tube grows faster than that membrane grows. And that forces it to, to <coughs> buckle and wrinkle. And that's why uh, the wiggles in my intestines are largely the same as the wiggles in all of your intestines. That's because they're all governed by an elastic wavelength. So what happens for the dress is I have um, here a, a piece of, uh, so I've got tool, so this is sort of soft and stretchy, and um, I'm attaching it to a a piece of boning that's inside a little uh, tube. So the boning is very stiff, it's inextensible, um, and the tool is very soft and stretchy. So what you do is you stretch the tool out as far as you can possibly stretch it, and you sew it to the extended um, boning, and then when you let it relax, the elasticity in the tool causes the entire thing to buckle and ruffle like this. So this is exactly the same process to form this wedding dress as it was to form your intestines. So there's a lot of places that we can see things like this, this negative curvature in nature. So this isn't something that's just uh, mathematical or something that's just in, in wedding dresses. Um, but you also see it in mitochondrial membranes, in soap films. Um, no one particularly knows whether or not the universe is, I mean, it locally has curvature. It seems to be, on average, extremely flat, like flatter than it should be. Um, but locally, there are bits of curvature in the universe. Um, and you see it in plants and animals all the time. <coughs> so, you, so this nudibranch swimming here is using the fact that it has negative curvature in its um, mantle and sending traveling waves down it as a way to propel itself forward. Um, also things like kale and um, this um, coral use the fact that um, they have a differential growth patterns. So they grow more towards the edge than they did at the center, and they can use this as a way to get um, more nutrients uh, uh, to them. So. Okay. Enough of all this squishy biology stuff. <laughs> what about some math? So, so okay. Another place to find curvature in a much more sort of rigid, uh, less squishy place, polyhedra. So let's just take this example of putting triangles around a vertex. So here are three of the platonic solids, uh, the tetrahedron, the octahedron, and the icosahedron. And you can think of these as, say, well, I'm going to take so many triangles, and I'm going to glue them together around each vertex, and I'm going to see what I get. And if I take three triangles, I make a tetrahedron. If I take four, I get a... Uh, octahedron and five, I get an icosahedron. Um, and just a bit of notation that will come in handy later on. Um, there are these uh, Schlafly symbols that are useful for describing uh, these different tilings. You can think of these as tilings of the sphere. Um, and so the, the numbers here, the, the first number is always three. That indicates that you're making something out of triangles. And then the second number says how many triangles go around each vertex. So three, three, three triangles around each vertex. Uh, so after 3, 3, 3, 4, and 3, 5, obviously 3, 6, and things have changed. Um, we've gone from things that are tilings of the sphere to uh, something that's tiling of the plane. 
Uh, and we've also, we've also switched from that positive curvature to flat curvature. And of course, if you go further, 3.7, then things get sort of weird. This is a, a 3D print. Uh, this isn't quite the same one of these uh, as, as is on the slide, but it's sort of fun to play with. I'll pass this around. Um, so 3.7, seven, seven triangles, there's too much of it. And just in the same way that uh, your intestines are ruffling, uh, these triangular tilings are also ruffling. Um, you can keep going 3.8, it just gets worse and worse and worse. Now there's uh, sort of an interesting thing going on here. Um, you know, these things here are all tilings of the sphere. Uh, I mean, you can imagine sort of blowing them up, uh, radially projecting, you would get a nice regular tiling of the sphere. This is a nice regular tiling of the plane. And then the question is, what is it that goes here? What is this a nice regular tiling of? And some sort of answer is the hyperbolic plane, um, which we will be simulating in the near future. Um, so this is some picture of the hyperbolic plane. Uh, this is the Poincaré disk model of the hyperbolic plane. Um, I'm sure everybody here has seen the Escher pictures, the angels and demons, the different, uh, um, uh, there are, I think, four in the series of circle limit pictures. Uh, this is uh, here highlighted in blue is one triangle out of the three seven tri uh, Strathley symbol tiling. So there's seven of those around here and then seven of those around there and so on and so forth. So one answer to that question the 3 7 tiling is a tiling of the hyperbolic plane. Um, there are different models, different ways to see this thing. So maybe less familiar than the, the uh, Poincaré disk model is the Klein model. Um, so the Klein model is, I mean, it's another sort of way to map the Poincaré disk into Euclidean space where we can see it. Um, here we've got uh, the geodesics, the straight lines are straight lines in Euclidean space. After you do the mapping into Euclidean space, you still straight, see straight lines but you don't get nice angles. Things are sort of distorted here in a way that they were not in the Poincaré disk model. Uh, there's also the, another very common model, the upper half plane model. Uh, again, this is, uh, you don't often see Escher pictures done like this. I'm sure it's been done by uh, people at Bridges, but the same sort of thing. And this time filling up the, up, the upper half uh, of the, the Euclidean plane. Now, um, this is something I, I think I, actually I'm not sure I ever talked about this at Bridges before. Um, but this is a, a cool thing that we threw in. So there's a, a really nice connection between these three different models, the Poincaré disk model, the Klein model, and the upper half plane model of H2. And they're all connected via this 3D hemisphere, which unfortunately we don't have with us here. Uh, this hemisphere model is an even less well-known uh, model, but it sort of shows the connection between these different ones. So if you put a, a point light source at the North Pole of this completed sphere, then the shadow you see on the plane is the Poincaré disk. Um, if you lift this light infinitely far up so the light rays come down parallel to each other, you see the Klein model. And if you put the light source on the equator of uh, the hemisphere, then casting onto the wall is the upper half plane model. OK, um, back to Escher. So we talked Escher. a little bit about these um, Escher uh, paintings before. So let's talk a little bit more about this one. Is uh, was work that was a collaboration between Escher and the mathematician Coxeter. Um, and the idea is that Escher wanted a way of depicting infinity. Uh, and looking at this Poincaré disk model of the hyperbolic plane is a very attractive way of doing that. Because what I'd like you to imagine is that you have, so you have uh, three demons here that are intertwined with three angels here. And this creates sort of a, a circle um, between the points where all of their wingtips touch. And I'd like you to imagine that as sort of a unit cell. And as you get further and further out, um, you can see here's another set of three demons intertwined with three angels, and their wingtips will also inscribe a circle. But I'd like you to imagine that that circle is actually the same size as the circle is um, initially. So, so this is taking something that's flat and in your mind bringing it out into a three-dimensional space, making it, um, making it work. So I'm going to show you a little animation of, um, of now removing the um, Escher picture and leaving behind these circles. So I have um, a circle of like three angels and three demons as a, as a hexagon here. And these are meeting four other hexagons at every set of wingtips. Um, and each of these circles, you should imagine, is the same size as, as every other circle. So this is, this is a model of hyperbolic space. So we couldn't 
put all of the hyperbolic plane onto, um, onto to the Euclidean plane without some distortion. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to look at a, a slightly different version. So this is um, a version where I, this is a dual of the um, Escher tiling. So here I have, instead of hexagons, I've got squares. Um, and instead of having four that meet around every vertex as they would in, um, in Euclidean space, I have six squares that meet around every vertex and hyperbolic space. So um, we're going to end up uh, walking through that space. But first, I should give you um, a few, uh, few words on how we actually create this space. So the idea is that all of these pictures are from, from the outside of the space. Oh, let me grab the blanket. Um, so this is, this is, a, so this is um, a blanket that was made from, um, uh, from this tiling here. So you can, this is what it would be like if I tried to make a Euclidean version of it. Um, so, so, <laughs> <laughs> so you can try as hard as you like and you won't be able to flatten it out. Um, so, so these are all pictures from outside of the hyperbolic plane. So what would it be like to be an ant that lived on, on that piece of kale or, or someone that's actually walking around what would it be like to be an angel or a demon in this Escher picture? So we'd like to know what it would be like to, um, to be a being that actually lives in a non-Euclidean space. Um, and so the key to that is, is that making, a, uh, constructing a space from the inside means that geodesics, that, that light rays have to follow geodesics. So here in Euclidean space, if I look up the projector, say, there is a straight line between a photon that bounces off the projector and a photon that enters my eye. And because we're in Euclidean space, that line is, a, that geodesic is a straight line. But in hyperbolic space, that geodesic can be something else. So no matter what the curvature of space we're in, um, the uh, geodesic, so a photon leaving a spot, will follow a geodesic path and then hit the uh, eyeball of the viewer or the person inside the, uh, inside of that. All right, so there's um, four elements to creating a, a non-Euclidean world. The first is we need a model of the space. We need a way of associating numbers with positions in that space. And so for this, this uh, we are taking the hyperboloid model, which lives in um, and Minkowski E31 space for anyone who knows what that means, excellent. Otherwise, it's not important. Um, and so we need a way to draw points on the screen. And so this is following this idea that light rays follow a geodesic. So any point in that space must be connected to my eye by a geodesic. We need a way to move around that space. Um, and so we're going to do that using the vibe. So at the beginning, I told you that we've got these couple of lighthouses in the corner. So they are constantly um, sort of triangulating the position of the headset. So that means that any tiny motion that a person in the headset does will track as a <coughs> vector into our, uh, into our simulation. And that will correspond to a translation in our hyperbolic space. Um, and those translations in hyperbolic space are um, isometries of the hyperboloid that, that leave the hyperboloid unchanged. Um, and then we need a set of landmarks for the viewers uh, to help them navigate that space. And so for us, that's going to be based on that blanket that went around. So rooms are going to be cubes with the corners cut off. So they're going to be truncated cubes. And they're going to be colored um, in a different way. So um, I need my first volunteer. I saw your hand first. Yes, come on on. You are very enthusiastic, so. Right. What's your name? Florence. Florence, nice to meet you. All right, um, so I'm going to ask you to stand right here in the center of the square facing the audience. Yeah, don't worry about it. Um, so in the middle? In the middle, yeah. Put the headset on so you're not going to be able to see much. And oh, let me switch it over so everyone can see what Florence is seeing. Um, Okay, so this is um, what Florence is seeing now. All right, so can you stand um, 
So can you see the space now? Yeah. OK. <laughs> <laughs> All right, can you stand facing uh, one of, sorry, I guess the, one of the um, octagonal windows? Yes, sorry, the floor is not going to be, actually, let me ask you to take this off for one second. I'm going to ask you to stand facing the diagonal. Yeah. Okay, and then do this again, and then I'm going to put her back in it. Sorry, the, um, there's some weird thing about the aspect ratio of which these set up and what orientation the viewer sees first. So I'm going to put her back in this. Okay, so now, okay, actually she's facing there. All right, so I'm just going to ask her to walk straight ahead into the next cell. So you will see a blue grid that appears um, out of nowhere. Don't walk through that because that means you might hit something in the real world. So, um, <laughs> all right. So now that you're in the center of that cell, I'm going to ask you to turn 90 degrees to the left. And now you're going to face um, a light green cell. So you can walk into that cell. So this is the second cube she's walked into. Yeah. Before, standing on the court. Court. Oh, sorry. 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 <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Okay. Uh, then turn uh, 90 degrees again to the left and walk into that room. So you'll get very close to the wall. So stop right there. <laughs> All right. And turn 90 degrees to the left again and walk into this room. So this is a seven color room. So if this were Euclidean space, she'd be back where she started. Um, and I'm going to ask her to turn, she's going to try to walk back to this original cube, so turn 90 degrees to the left again, and now she's facing the dark red room, she can walk into that. I can? Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then turn 90 degrees to the left again, and this is the um, room that she's supposed to, she started in, and then turn 90 degrees to the left again, and that's where she started facing. All right. So you can take off your goggles and see where you're facing. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, think, let's everyone think well. Right? <laughs> so the fact that she um, started in this cell facing in this direction and ended up in this cell facing this direction after she went around a complete loop is um, something that's called polynomy. So I'm going to attempt to plug in my other computer and show you what this should look like. OK, so this is a little animation that shows what Florence did. So she started in um, this dark green uh, cube and walked forward into a teal cube, and turned left 90 degrees, and walked <coughs> into a pale green cube and turn left 90 degrees, and walked into a pale yellow cube, and turn left 90 degrees again, and walked into a salmon cube. So this is where she would have ended up if this was Euclidean space. She turns 90 degrees again, and walks into a, a crimson cube, and turns 90 degrees to the left again, walks back into the first cube she started. So this is the sixth cube. Yes? Did, did you want to say anything about the cross-eye stereo effect? Getting that. We will talk about that later. Okay. Um, so what she yeah, so what she is seeing is, is, is stereo. Um, and it looks like three dimensions to her. But we will discuss that in detail a little bit later. Um, so, so this is um, an effect of something that's called polynomy. So, this is a concept that, despite it sounding very foreign and something that we're quite used to, um, so you can imagine, uh, I'm going to start uh, on the world, imagine, and I've got my um, left arm pointing up and my, or sorry, my right arm pointing up and my left arm pointing um, around the equator, and I'm going to always keep this orientation, and I'm going to walk in a loop that starts here, goes around here, comes back up and ends up here and see what happens to my arm. So my right arm is up following blue, and my left arm is out following red. So I walk over a quarter of the way around the world. I'm perfectly fine. Then I walk up the, the side of the wall to, um, to the North Pole, which uh, I can't do because I'm not in an awesome OK Go music video. Um, <laughs> and so my um, remember, my right arm is facing um, in the uh, blue direction, and my uh, left arm is facing in the red direction, so they're facing like that. Then I'm going to come back down here, 
my left arm is now facing out, or sorry, my right arm is now facing out, my left arm is facing up. So when I've completed a closed path on a curved space, I get back to the same place I started, but there's a frame that's attached to me, so I know what left, right, up and down, forwards and backwards are, so I've got a frame attached to my head, and that frame has come back rotated. So this is what, um, what Florence experienced when she was walking around um, uh, our space. And this is what would happen in, um, in, in hyperbolic space. So imagine uh, she starts here, and she's facing along the red arrow, and she's got one arm sticking out along the blue arrow. And she's going to always sort of maintain that, and she's going to basically be executing moves like this now. So she's not going to change her orientation, but she's going to walk around in the same path she did before. So now she's going to walk um, towards her extended arm, and then towards her back into the next cell, then the opposite direction of her extended arm, and then she gets to go forward again, and then towards the direction of her extended arm, and then back once again. And when she comes back, she will notice that she has been rotated by 180 degrees, which is why she started facing you this way and ended up facing in this direction. All right, so um, can I have another volunteer? Uh, I think I saw you first. Hello. What's your name? So, Alex. Alex, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. I believe I saw you with your dress. Yeah. Uh, yes. All right, so. Um, stand anywhere you like and um, put on the headset. Switch over. Okay. There we go. All right. So, <laughs> all right. Uh, let's see. Why don't you take about three big steps back? Okay, now face, um, let's see, turn slight, no, you're fine there. Uh, I was going to say turn slightly towards your left and face a cube. Sure. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's dangerous. That, no, towards. I can see the grid, so. Yeah, this, this left is perfect. Okay, so what you're, so you're staring through kind of a, a pale green window into another pale green window, followed by another pale green window, and a fourth pale green window. So for the audience, he's staring at this one, into this one, into this one, into this one. So uh, I'm going to ask you to walk forward into the next cell. And the audience, I'd like you to look at those windows and look at how they're changing in aspect. You can keep walking uh, one more cell. Um, look at how they're changing in aspect ratio as he walks forward. All right, thank you so much, Alex. Move it. Pardon? Yeah, you can take it off. <laughs> <laughs> So the effect of changing aspect ratio um, in, in this space has to do with the fact that um, this is not purely um, hyperbolic space. So this is not purely the hyperbolic plane, but it's the hyperbolic plane that's crossed with the Euclidean line. So if you look up and down, distances are, um, should I? Sure, okay. go for it. I can stick my head in it for a sec. Um, so I look up uh, or down, distances appear to fall off um, in a Euclidean way. So people might actually get a bit of vertigo if they do that, if um, they're prone to something like that. Um, but so distances, because of the sort of vanishing points, distances um, appear to get linearly smaller in, um, as they get further and further away in Euclidean space. But in hyperbolic space, they're getting exponentially smaller which is why the aspect ratio on the rooms changes so much. So it's always a, a fixed aspect ratio, and it's one to one. But as you walk through it, the uh, hyperbolic direction appears to be um, exponentially <coughs> smaller the further away you get. So just to reiterate that point, the, the aspect ratio of the, the windows goes from this when it's very far away to this when it's very close. And the reason is that if you're far away, uh, well, as the distance away from uh, of you away from something increases in the hyperbolic direction, the horizontal direction, uh, 
the, the things, uh, or the size of it appears to go down exponentially, whereas in the Euclidean direction is only linearly, so the aspect ratio changes. So, so, the, the, so the first thing we showed you was two-dimensional hyperbolic in this horizontal direction and Euclidean in the vertical direction, and now hyperbolic in all directions, so H3. Um, so, uh, so what is different here? So, uh, I mean, it's a whole different space, it's a whole different geometry, we need a whole different tiling. So let me tell you about the tiling first. So the tiling that we saw previously, that was this, the same thing as the blanket, horizontally, and then just re repeated vertically. So just stack up cubes made out of these horizontal squares. So, well, going from two-dimensional to three-dimensional space, I'm back to these, these Schlafly symbols here. Uh, so we had threes before, three, three was the first three was triangles and the second was how many vertices, so how many triangles go around each vertex. This one is four, four, the first one says squares, the second one says four squares around each vertex, that's the usual time in the Euclidean plane. So there's a way to extend this to three dimensions. Um, so this three-dimensional Schlafly symbol here, so the way to read this is the first two numbers tell you what are the tiles that you're going to make your three-dimensional tiling out of. So four, three, what is 4, 3? Cube, right? It's made out of squares. It's got three around each vertex. And then this last uh, digit here says how many of those polyhedra fit around each edge. So four cubes around each edge gives you the usual Minecraft tiling of the Euclidean uh, space. OK, so we need to do this in hyperbolic space and understand what's going on. So, uh, so again, two-dimensional to three-dimensional hyperbolic space. This is the 4, 5 tiling. The tiling we were seeing before, we didn't, see it, didn't say it, but that was the 4, 6 tiling has squares with six around each vertex. This is squares with five around each vertex seen in the Poincaré disk model. This is cubes again, four, three, with five around each edge seen in the Poincaré ball model, the three-dimensional version of that. Sort of hard to see what's going on. Um, and we're actually gonna go to four, three, six, which has some other weird effects. Um, so let's talk about four, three, six. So this is four, three is cubes. The six says that there's six cubes around each vertex. And I haven't attempted to sort of draw the whole thing. I'm just going to draw layers for you. So here's the cube, sort of a central cube. And then if I stick one cube on each of the faces of that one, then I get more of this tiling. And then I stick a cube onto each of the faces of those things. And there's uh, a cube that's missing here. So I've gone, I've gone two layers out. So I started with one cube, and I added two, and I added two. And this is where we are now. There's a space for the sixth cube in, in around here. So, um, so that hopefully gives some sense of what this tiling is. Here's a 3D print. Um, uh, I should say a lot of these prints and the, the images were made by Royce Nelson. Um, we have a, Royce and I have a paper in JMA recently, which goes into some of these aspects of this tiling. So what you're supposed to do with this one here, it's sort of half of the Poincaré ball. You're supposed to look in the, the, the I guess the, the equatorial disk side and that will show you roughly the view that you're going to see inside of the hyperbolic space. Turn this around. Um, OK, now we switch back, yes. right? OK, we, so I need another volunteer. But this volunteer has to be willing to be really silly. OK, you look very excited about being silly, so come on up. What is your name? Sarah. Sarah, all right. Um, so when you put on the headset, I will switch you over to um, Wait a Actually, wait, no, before you put on the headset, we're going to walk through the dance moves you're going to We're going to oh. do hyperbolic dancing. <laughs> okay. So, okay, so the first dance move I'm going to ask you to do is you're going to stand here and make a hula hoop with your head. So I instead of with your, yes. But I'm so willing to do this, but I know that you were looking really like you wanted to. Well, it's okay. Are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to get out of it now. Uh, she said dancing, so yeah. <laughs> okay. Move your head in as big a circle as you possibly can. Okay? So that's the first dance move. Then the second dance move is going to be move your head in a, a big square in this direction. So you're going to go sort of like this. Okay? And then the third one is actually kind of hard for humans who have a spine, but um, so you're going to kind of go in a big circle. Like this. Keep your head? Yeah, like yeah. Your head. Okay. You can keep your head level. Like, you just want to like, move your head in as big a circle okay. as possible. Okay. okay. So, okay. So, you can put on the headset. And I will put you into 3D hyperbolic space. 
So I'm going to, this is the normal tiling we use, but uh, for this particular demo, I'm going to switch it so she's just inside um, clay and cubes. Uh, are you not seeing it? Oh, sorry, I have not put, I have to figure it out for her. Oh, there we go. Sorry. <laughs> Okay, so pick whichever of those three you like best, and we'll start with that. Go with this one. <laughs> okay. Is that fitting you comfortably, or do you want me to make the little header? Yeah, hold it where it's comfortable on your face, and then I'll take it for you. Is that better? Mm -hmm. And start out facing one of the squares of the cube, any one yeah. you want, and then we'll see what. That's fine. Yeah, and it's purple. Okay, purple is perfect. good. Okay, so yeah, everyone keep an eye on the colors around. So if she's staring into purple and there's blue on the right, yellow on the left, red up and cyan down. So okay, so now pick whichever of your favorite dance moves and then do that. Wait, what was the first one? The first one was a head hula hoop. Oh, yes. Am I supposed to keep looking forward as much as possible? Uh, yeah, you can do that. It's, <laughs> it'll make it easier for the viewers. Um, <laughs> but. All right, you can stop there for a sec. And notice that her feet haven't moved, but the um, she has to turn her head now pretty far to the right to see um, the original purple cube she was looking at. All right, so now, so so this is this is another version of polynomy. So she's got a frame on her head that tells her what. Uh, forward and back is left and right and up and down. And as she's moving her head in circles like this, it's not affecting the up and down direction, but it is affecting the left and right, forward and back. So as she goes around in, in a little circle, her uh, that frame is rotating by a little bit. If she goes around in a big, big, big circle, that frame's gonna move quite a lot. So the amount that the angle changes is proportional <laughs> to the area swept out by her head. <laughs> Oh, okay, so you, have, you, haven't, you haven't changed which way the floor is yet. Yeah, so, so uh, take another dance move. Right. Okay, this one. Excellent. Okay, so now she's going to turn her head around this way. So what should be happening is that as she's rotating around in this direction, she's sort of dragging the world with her. Oh my gosh. <laughs> of the circle as a fixed uh, as the fixed vector and everything's <laughs> rotating around that so everything is rotating up along along with that. Um, do you want to try the last one now? Yes, this is a square one. Right? This is a square one, yeah. Basically we're just going in our three spatial dimensions, right? Yes. That's what these dance moves are. Yes, the dance moves are are, are in our three. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so what's happening now is she's rotating the world like this. So you might ask why we decided to put cubes in. If we decided to put um, like a living room and a sofa and floor, they would slowly wander up the <laughs> side of the wall while someone's wandering around. So <laughs> all right, thank you so much, Sarah. <laughs> All right, uh, can I have one more volunteer, please? The green shirt. What's your name? Sam. Sam, nice to meet you. Why don't you put that on? Um, you can, I can hold your glasses up here if you like. All right, so because the world has been rotated like crazy, I'm gonna reset your view, Sam. Okay. So, okay, so. Okay, so this is uh, the main view, and what I'm gonna do is I'm going to now um, remove the edges between, between uh, the rooms. So I'm gonna remove these edges and just leave these things that look like icosahedra behind. So, there you go. So Sam, I'm gonna ask you to find one of these things that looks like an icosahedron and stick your head inside. <laughs> you don't have to be timid. Um, there will be a. Oh yeah, I guess actually that does say. Uh, yeah. Oh yeah, perfect. <laughs> so it looks like an icosahedron from the outside, but it's not actually an icosahedron. Um, what it actually is is a Euclidean plane. So you can keep wandering around and finding different ones and checking them out, or seeing if you can wander around through them. Um, and 
as you kind of move along the edge, the tiling will continue along forever. So these, these are um, these are Euclidean planes. Um, so do you want to? Oh yeah. So so the three D print that's going around gives you a sense of what's going on here. So this is made out of cubes. 436 was the Schlafly symbol tiling. So 43 is a cube, 6 is the 6 around each edge. There's something very strange and unusual about this that doesn't happen in tilings of the uh, Euclidean space, which is that these cubes are ideal. You may have seen on one, the slide that I showed of the tiling outwards, the corners actually met the boundary of the Poincaré ball. The corners are actually infinitely far away. Um, and so unlike ordinary tilings of of uh, you know the tilings by cubes um, of uh, Euclidean space, if you look at sort of the neighborhood of a vertex, you don't get a finite object. You you in fact get this infinite tiling. Actually, there's, there's some cool sort of numerology kind of stuff you can do. Four, three, six. Um, the last two numbers, three, six, if I'm doing this right, give you the tiling that you see when you truncate the corners of the thing and you stick your face inside of it. So 3-6 is the tiling by uh, triangles of the Euclidean plane. If you did this with ordinary cubes in Euclidean space, that's 4-3-4, you see the 3-4 tiling when you look at a vertex and you truncate all of the corners at that vertex and see what you get. And 3-4 is, of course, the octahedron. So there's all kinds of weird stuff in hyperbolic space. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So. Sam, while you're in there, would you like to be put in there with an infinite number of monkeys? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so thanks for being such a great support. So we can also put um, Sam in there with an infinite number of monkeys. These look more like monkeys to him than they will to you, because um, they got pretty distorted on the screen. You may recognize these monkeys from some bridges some number of years ago. When those monkeys, there were eight of them at the time rather than an infinite number, and there were eight of them that were arranged inside of the eight cubes of a hypercube. Does anybody remember this? OK, some people remember. If not, just ignore the next two minutes. Or not eight. So, so we had a monkey inside of each of the eight cubes of the hypercube. And they have this sort of interesting uh, twisting screw motion relationship between e each of them. And you see the same thing here. So uh, I don't know, Sam, if you can find a monkey and, and, uh, and look at it. And let's see. So. If you, so that monkey right in front of you, if you look up, there's another monkey. And what is the relationship between those two monkeys? Uh, it's a little hard to see from this, but, but there's one monkey that's who's, whose head is sort of pointing this way, and the next one up is pointing that way. So as you move forward, you also have to twist to the left. So this works in the uh, eight cubes of the hypercube. You can put this monkey design in there, and it all, and it all fits together. Um, the hypercube, each Slafly symbol is 433 because you've got cubes, 4, 3, and then there's 3 around each edge. This is 4, 3, 6, and the fact that 6 is double 3 means you can get away with doing the same thing here. Um, it doesn't work if you try and do this with 4, 3, 4, the Minecraft tiling. Uh, somehow you need there to be a 3 in there for this go forward, rotate, click, symmetry thing to work. Um, All right. Thank you so much, Sam. All right. All right. And lastly, uh, there was a question about um, the fact that this is binocular vision in the Vive. Um, and one thing that um, I guess Sam probably noticed, but I'm not sure um, anyone else really had the experience to, is that in that um, in that space where it looks like there are jewels everywhere, it looks like you're inside a sphere that's about a meter big, even though this should be infinite, and these are hyperbolic distances, and they're falling off, um, uh, so the, the, they're getting smaller exponentially fast, as we discussed um, in, in H2 cross E. But this is sort of one of my favorite things about this, is that it turns out that um, it looks like it's about a meter across, not because of the vibe, not because of how we calculated it, but because our brains were brought up Euclidean. So as someone who sees things uh, with binocular vision, I'm used to pointing my eyes uh, parallel to one another to look at a point at infinity. So those will converge at infinity if they, the, I don't know if I sent 
rays out of my eyeballs parallel to one another, they will converge at infinity. But what happens in hyperbolic space is because geodesics diverge, if I had my eyes pointing straight ahead, I'd end up staring at two things that are infinitely far apart um, in different directions. So if I want to focus my eyes on something that is infinitely far apart, I actually need to point my eyes inwards, and that's a cue to my Euclidean brain that there's something that's a finite distance in my brain because I've grown up as a, as a Euclidean citizen, my, my <laughs> brain knows how to interpret that as, as a relative distance, and my brain says, oh, that's about a meter. Um, so it turns out that this is, this is actually what has to happen for, um, for one to uh, see in, um, in, in hyperbolic space. All right, so I think that does it for now. Oops, this is... Did monkeys. Monkeys, yes. Um, and so... Thank you all so much for your attention, and I think we've got a little bit of time for questions. Ooh. Oh, just oh, before okay, this. Sorry, sorry so, I totally forgot. Andrea got this working very recently, so anyone who has a smartphone on them, they can go to h 3 hypernom H-Y-P-E-R-N-O-M, dot com. Um, and and they can play around in H3 with their phone. Should we the, try bringing it up? Uh, it, no, it's not okay. going to work. All on right. That. So this, I don't, so it uses the uh, orientational axes on your phone to change the direction you're pointed in. And if you press on the screen, it drives you forward. Yes. Can you just say what that is again? Uh, it is. Let's see. Let me grab a pen and I'll write it on the board. I would recommend going into one of those corners on this. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's an excellent idea. OK, well, let's start doing questions. Uh, so do you need a gyroscope microphone for that? Yeah, the, 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 it uses the gyro of the phone. Yes. Yeah. So if you have a smartphone, it has to have a gyroscope. Yeah. Most smartphones do have a gyroscope, I think. Oh. More questions. Uh, question. Polynomy. Okay, if you were living in hyperbolic space, would you just, like, is there any solution to not experience that, or would you just have to get used to it? Is that, like, I don't know, I mean, what I was doing is, like, how would you, how would you perform normal actions? <laughs> well, you'd be, get very used to just moving your head around to correct, like, to correct it? Yeah. yeah, I think I you would just, the, I mean, part of the problem is that you have a very strong sense of up and down, because yeah. of gravity. Gravity would have to work a different way if you actually lived inside of hyperbolic space. Okay. And so... Yeah. Right. Yeah, doing virtual experience... I mean, this is sort of the reason for doing H2 cross E, is that the floor always stays where it should do. There's no mixing between the hyperbolic and the Euclidean. <laughs> He's unhappy. Yeah. I was wondering, so you talk about doing this with an actual room furniture and things like that, what does it feel like? We haven't we dared. <laughs> <laughs> that was this an original idea. idea. That, yeah. Well, then we started thinking, well, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah. I mean, people get dizzy enough. I, I mean, I guess <laughs> Sarah was finding it kind of... Uh, it's fun. It's <laughs> fun, but it's a little bit uncomfortable to get used to, even with abstract cubes. Uh, so when you're developing software in like Euclidean space, you can kind of tell if you've done something wrong, like if you move forward but the screen moves right. How do, but like, how do you tell, like, how do you debug something like this? How do we know that it like actually follows the rule? You just have to trust us. Uh, so, so debugging it was kind of an interesting um, problem, uh, particularly for H2 cross E. The, the big thing is we wanted to not only see along geodesics, but to make sure that we travel along them too. So we could debug it by saying, like, have a little um, set of, like, a little X in the center of the screen and put that at a target. And if you go forward to the target and you hit the target, then it's doing the right thing. If not, it's not. So that's, I mean, we did it by following the DUC along geodesics. I think we'll call it there. And we'll do something later on so people can try. <laughs>